Good morning. And welcome to Redlands United Methodist Church in Grand Junction, Colorado. It is a beautiful, warm, delightful Easter morning. And we thank you for joining us and being with us, whether you are here in the sanctuary or elsewhere. We have a few announcements that we would like to, to make in order to begin. Please remember to wear your masks, especially while singing and practice social distancing. If you did not pick up your communion cups, raise your hands and we can get a few spread around here. I think Dick has some in the, in the back. There's a few down in the front here, Dick. If you wish to share communion with your neighbor online, please feel free to grab a couple on your way out. If you need gluten-free, we have crackers available. Please raise your hand or talk to someone in the back row. We do have you covered for that. Pastor Loretta is not 100% yet, and she wrote this, so it goes like this. Pastor Loretta is not 100% yet, so we have me, and I'm Don, to bring good news. She has a vacation scheduled and plans cannot be rearranged, so she will be back here in two weeks. Next week, Gayla Jo will preach. Pastor said to tell you that she is excited for all the joy of the season and is grateful for all of you. And she sent a letter. Happy Easter, friends. I hate bringing sad news on a happy day, but I am not well yet. I am feeling stronger every day. It came suddenly and stayed with a vengeance. Yet God, God's love was displayed in the good works of so many people. Excuse me. Thanks to Bill and Richard who took over the Bible studies. Thanks to Hal, who had his feet washed, a long story, but God was glorified. Gee, masks are fun. <laughs> Thanks to Kevin, Dick, and Bill for doing meetings without me. Thanks to Cheryl for working above and beyond to Bernita for time and effort to make sure these beautiful flowers were available. Not only did she donate the flowers we have for the Living Cross, but she picked up the flowers, including the beautiful Easter lilies, which were donated by Nikki Hahn. Isabel also picked up flowers and arranged our altar and our sanctuary in the beautiful display that we have now. And say thanks to Craig. He's been filling in and doing nice little things for weeks now. I mean, he's just been great. I am thankful for Margaret, who called on people and checked on people and was a musician in this time, our busiest time. I'm also grateful for Reverend Don Schlichting, who substituted in the last minute, last 30 minutes last week, and prepared today's service with all the intricate modifications we enjoy for Easter Sunday. And then, in my absence, let us all in worship and celebration of our risen Lord. I would be remiss if I did not mention my husband, Craig, who answered phone calls, emails, and texts for me, substituted for me in the Maundy Thursday and Good Friday services, and led music with Margaret at today's service at sunrise. He made music videos and compiled pictures and text and presented us with the amazing videos we have enjoyed both in service and online. Finally, I am grateful for the heart of God which shines bright to illuminate our days and our darkest nights. Thank you, God for sending us Jesus Christ to walk with us and laugh with us and rejoice with us. Hallelujah and amen. Yes, I had a series of symptoms. I sought help through medical science and prayer, and I think I turned a major corner. Thank you for your continued prayers. Reflecting on my pain made me think about just what Easter celebrates. We celebrate the empty tomb. But what is in that tomb? Pain and confusion and fear and torturous thoughts that haunt us to this day. This pain stinks. But the good news, the good news in capital letters, 
is that God joined us in the tomb, then opened it to lead us out. Christ has risen. Christ has risen indeed. I am stronger, friends, and will be full strength by the next time you see me. That's not totally correct, and I'll point that out in a second. In the meantime, celebrate. Rejoice, dance if you feel like it. In a few moments, our gifted musicians will begin their praise. At that time, bring your flowers to the living cross. And while you are here, inhale deeply. Smell the flowers, listen to the voices, see the beautiful people all made in God's image. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. And one little pause. The next time you see her will be on your way out because she's sitting in the back of the sanctuary, in case you hadn't noticed yet. And if you want any idea of how poorly a preacher is feeling when they're supposed to be up here and they've got themselves on a seat in the back of the sanctuary, that's a sign. So say hi to her. Tell her how much she's loved and missed and appreciated uh, and how great it is to, to have her here. Please bring your, your flowers to the living cross during, during the first song and let us, oh, and one other announcement. The lilies that are up here are all available at the end of the service. If you would like to take one of these and take them home and use that as a part of your celebration of Easter ongoing, please do so because that's what they're for. Please, please do that. Let us begin. Christ the Lord is risen today. Cross the 
As you consider your gifts and offering today, please remember to give not out of fear or obligation, <coughs> but with a joyful heart. If you would like to give now, you may leave an offering in our plates in the back at any time during the service. If you would like to send a check, you may send it to Redlands UMC 527 Village Way, Grand Junction, Colorado 81507. If you would like to give electronically, you may use your tithe, our Tithely app. You may download the app onto your phone or access the link on our webpage at redlandsumc.org. We are very grateful for all your gifts and love. Your faith in us and your faithfulness to us sustains us as we strive to honor our mission, love God, learn, live. Please enjoy this offering of music. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see
is a new creation coming. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Yes. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, he is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Of blessing and honor and glory, is he worthy of this? He is. Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit? among us yes. and as Jesus our Messiah hold forever those he loves yes. does our God intend to dwell again with us he does Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, he is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Risen God, mysterious God who is with us even now, we thank you for the gifts you have given to us first, life, love, time, resources. Today we offer up to you a portion of the gifts you gave. Please grant us one more gift, the gift of wisdom to use these gifts in the manner that builds your kingdom here on earth. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, 
Amen. We begin with the psalmist. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And Isaiah continues us on. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days. An old person who does not live out a lifetime for one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth, and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity. For they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord as their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. And we continue on with the Gospel of Luke. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners, be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and then he went home amazed at what had happened. Charles Dickens begins his tale of two cities, saying that it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Easter is such a time. It is the best, it is the worst. The worst because it is so hard to preach. That is, one never feels as if the subject has been treated adequately. After all, how can one deal with this day adequately? Whatever is said, it is not enough. Not profound enough, not brilliant enough, or inspirational enough, just not enough. But it is also the best of times, 
For what is said proclaims the truth, the reality, and thus cannot be really bad, cannot fail. Jesus is risen. That is the truth. Perhaps the sermon should both begin and end right there. But being a preacher, you know, it's the worst of times. Because it demands that we proclaim this seeming incongruous fact. Here the commentator writing in the early 1950s in an age of great growth for the church. Much is made, he said, in our time of the fact that the idea of a bodily resurrection is not congenial to the modern mind. The very statement itself might seem in a measure offensive. If it was true in the 50s, imagine how it is today. Christianity is seen by many as being ridiculous because it insists on this ridiculous claim. The tomb was empty. How ridiculous. Today we claim great scientific knowledge and rationality. We like to believe what we can see and test and verify in the laboratory. It is indeed the worst of days for we must proclaim the gospel witness and affirm that indeed the tomb was empty and so offend some and be ridiculed and laughed at by others. But it is the best of times. For we have what we believe to be truth on our side. The commentator then continues, it should hardly be necessary to remind oneself that the modern mind is scarcely the final arbiter of truth, nor is one bound to suppose that truth will always be found congenial to it. Truth, in fact, is often not congenial to the way we would like to have things to be. We learn that in politics, in finances, in ecological realities, in relationship, in life. We have often discovered that our greatest learning and knowledge, which we thought elevated us to a high plateau of learning and sophistication, has in fact been proven wrong. The earth, in case you hadn't noticed or learned, is not flat. Heavier than aircraft, can indeed fly. And the physics book was rewritten four times in the last century. And now noted scientists are beginning to say that there well may be something to this spirituality stuff, for we keep running into something that we cannot otherwise explain. The story tells us that the disciples had the same problem. The women went to the tomb to finish their job of preparing the body of Jesus for burial, to pay their final respects and to love and honor him one last time. But the stone was rolled away. The tomb was empty. At least it was empty of Jesus. And there were instead two angels who asked a most remarkable question. Why do you seek the living among the dead. How often do we do the same? How often do we seek Jesus not among the living but among the dead if we would find him in a graveyard instead of in the office or at home or at church? They went back to the disciples and told them of their discovery and they received the same response we so often receive. It is an idle tale. Don't bother us with your tales. We are busy grieving here, feeling sorry for ourselves. Go away and leave us alone. The disciples, like many of us, like many in our day, thought the story nothing but an idle tale. Even verse 12 doesn't say that Peter believed, but that he went away amazed, but apparently still wondering. If you believe... I mean, really, truly, believe with a capital B that Jesus rose from the dead, then take this day and revel in it. Take this day and join the song of the ages and sing that Christ the Lord is risen today. Join the psalmist and proclaim that this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. If you believe, then take that belief and shout it from the mountaintops, for you have the witness of history and truth behind you, and such a reality should be proclaimed with all we have to shout it with. But if you are one of those who believes, 
but with a small b. Or if you're one of those who goes along with the tale in order to satisfy the family or friends because you really think that Christianity is a good way to go because the teachings, after all, do make a great sense, then join me for a moment and follow along. I will not convince you by argument, for that has seldom really worked except to lay the groundwork to begin to open the doors to let in the light, the possibility. It is not reason alone, but experience that is undergirded by reason that convinces. It is never, you see, a preacher or anyone else who convinces any of us of Christ. I do not save anyone, nor do you. God does. God may use us, but God does the saving. It helps to keep us humble to remember that. Join Peter then this day. He heard the tale. He called it idol and went back to his business. But he couldn't quite get it out of his mind. So he went to check it out for himself. And he goes and finds an empty tomb, but apparently no angels. Now several possibilities occurred to him, and he was not convinced, but he went away wondering. That is what I hope you will do. Go away wondering, for wonder leaves itself open to possibilities, and that is what God asks for, openness to hear and to accept, and that God can and will work with. We begin then with the early church. The reality is that at this moment, There was nothing more than a very small band of people deeply engrossed in grief and pain. The disciples had gone into hiding. The larger band of followers had disappeared back into the countryside. And the few women who were closest to him are left alone and perplexed. Jesus is gone. The tomb is empty. And the disciples don't believe what they have to say. But then, within just hours, within a very few days, everything is turned around. Peter, who was wishy-washy and unconvinced, becomes a rock of faith and of commitment. The dispersed band is rejoined and a fourth is set, force is set forth upon this world that will change the entirety of human history. That is reality, historic and verifiable. And the only thing, the only thing that distinguishes one moment from another is the affirmation that these people saw and experienced the risen Lord, period. That's it. They saw, they experienced, they went forth. The entire history of the church is set upon that and reaffirms it over and over again. Never again is it claimed that anyone saw Jesus himself after the experience on the Damascus road of Saul, who becomes Paul. But over and over again, There is the witness of those who have experienced the presence of Christ, the touching of the promised Holy Spirit in their lives. From St. Francis, who gave up worldly wealth to lead an order of monks who swore poverty, to Martin Luther, who found God in a lightning bolt and threw one of his own at the church that so needed reform, to John Wesley, whose heart was strangely warmed and who set the world on fire in a movement of evangelism and zeal and music and service, to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who stood defiant before the power of Hitler, to Reinhold Niebuhr, who called the industrial giants to moral task, to Martin Luther King, Jr., who threw in our face the questions of race and equity and righteousness that were and are so hard to face and yet have to be faced, to Mother Teresa, who showed us again the power of servanthood and the absurdity of worldly power. Through it all, these people have changed the world because they have known and witnessed the risen Lord. And you, you have known him too, Think back, wonder at your own life. Where has God reached out and touched you? And you were too busy to see or chose instead to ignore or to rationalize because it was easier and less demanding than to believe. Where have you known grace and love and acceptance 
Where have you been able to put past sins, past mistakes behind you and to go on with life? How have you benefited from all the churches offered and done through the edu- ages in your education, your health care, from living in a caring and beneficent society? In me, where have I seen Christ? In my father, who saw war and hated it and discouraged it in me, who gave up friendship and fortune and spent long hard years paying for it because of his belief in what was right that morals came before profit who was used by others and who by the standards of the world had a right to bitterness but refused it whose words to his eldest son at his wedding were remember remember that Christ is the most important thing from my mother, who taught us respect and kindness for others, who served year after year in her church, through the changes of pastors and all of the oh-so-human struggles and conflicts that went on, who taught us by example and word of the importance of God in our life, in the acts of love and support and giving from the community when my brother lay near death from an accidental gunshot wound when businessmen canceled trips and came home to give blood, that a boy they knew not might live from my parents' faith through that time. In the halls of First Methodist Church in Casper, when Reverend Monty Jackson said to me that your family ought to produce one good preacher, And I could not shake off the conviction that God had called. In the voice of J.C. Witter, the Dean of Admissions at Southwestern College, who called a few years later in one of those dark and hurting times when I was trying to forget and to walk away in anger from the church, and he said to me, I have a house, a scholarship, and a job in a church. And I knew that God had redialed and connected again. In the mountains and on the plains of this incredible region as I saw the wonders of creation and came to realize that it cannot all be a mere coincidence. It cannot be an accident. As I came to see and understand that there is an order and a purpose in creation and that we each and every one of us have a part to play in it. In Craig, where I started a church for the conference, and we did it all wrong and with the wrong expectations, and we succeeded. Where we did great ministry and made a difference, and I knew that the only reason, the only reason was that the Spirit had worked in me. In ten years of working in the field of domestic violence, where I learned profoundly The lesson that the fantasy of a world of love is the only reality that matters. That the reality of a world of dominance and violence is a world of evil and destruction and will eventually take us all down with it. In a single vision of Kay. Standing in the dorm door the moment I met her. And the assurance that she was a gift from a loving God who cares for me and who has enabled me through her to do the ministry I have done. In a lifetime of living in two worlds, the real world and the coming world, this is the reality of ministry. You stand with one foot firmly planted in the world of politics and money and getting ahead and physical reality and the other foot equally firmly planted in the kingdom of God, an ideal place which our Lord says is both present and yet to be. It is present to the extent that we stand in it, live it, and share it, and future to the extent that we have not yet fully accepted and learned to live in it. But it is sure, for it is the promise of God who faithfully keeps the covenant with us. I know the real world. I have seen the worst of it. 
I have seen death and destruction. I have seen promises made and broken. I have seen depression, the politics called recession and recession that was called recovery. I have married and buried and baptized and counseled. That foot is firmly planted. But many know me not as a realist, but as a dreamer, a visioner. And I am, thank God. For my task calls me to see not only what is, but what can be and what should be. My task is to be a bridge between the two and to constantly call us from one to the other. It is not always a comfortable task, for it means also that the Christian has to evaluate the world in which we live by the standards of the world which we are to be working for. And the disparity is great. The final question you see is what is reality? According to all we know, the body could not have been resurrected. But according to all we know, the bumblebee cannot fly. Or did someone recently figure that one out? According to reason, Christianity is largely idealistic and utterly unreasonable. But according to reason, the Soviet Union could not have fallen and the Cold War should still be going on. In the 8th century before Christ, Isaiah said that the lion and the lamb would lay down together, that there would be a world of peace and harmony, and throughout history, people of reason have scoffed at the idea. In the 21st century, we are learning that unless we all come together and learn to live in peace, we will instead all die together. Not from the bang of nuclear destruction, though that is still not entirely out of the question, but from the whimper of overpopulation, overpollution, and the ballooning effects of greed and avarice on the entire globe. The women ran. They ran and told Peter and the disciples. But they said it was an idle tale and turned back to their tasks. But Peter went and checked it out and went away wondering. I wonder, too, not about the resurrection, for of that I am sure, but rather I wonder about you and God and how God will touch you, how God has touched you, and how you will respond. For Easter is only the beginning Only the first morning of a whole new world, a whole new time, a whole new life. There is, as they say, more to follow. And let us do exactly that. Let us follow where our Lord leads us. Let us pray. It is an incredible day, Lord. The sun is up, the skies are blue, the birds are singing. The temperature is warm and nice and invites us out into this creation you have given. Help us, Lord, as we go, as we return to your world, to know that we walk beside you, that you are with us, Grant us, Lord, ears to hear your call and your word, the wisdom to know and feel and respond to your touch. Help us to feel the nudges you give, the encouragement you offer, and the invitation that is yours to come and follow and serve. Teach us, God, to be your body and your presence that as we go into the world on this and every day to follow, in all that we are and all that we do, all the world might see and know and experience at least a little bit of the love and the care and the hope that is you, that is in your risen Son, your presence in us and in your world. Be with us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
we invite you to join us with us in the service of communion that will be up on the board. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you. And blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and the Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, We offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, our honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray together as our Lord taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgo them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing of the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is the, is the sharing in the blood of Christ. You may open your little thing. The bread is in the top and the juice below. The body of Christ given for you, taken it in remembrance and in thanksgiving.
the blood of Christ given for you. Take and drink in remembrance and in thanksgiving. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Go in peace this day. Go in hope and in joy. For Christ is indeed with you, is indeed risen, is indeed among us.
Go then in his name that in all you are and all you do, all the world might see his presence, his love, his hope. Amen.